California. He or she, it's not really mentioned, flies out to California and sets out to figure this shit out. Now, it's been something like four years now, and when they arrive, they quickly realize that there's just no way to track down who was here back when the calls were made. However, they did speak to the investigating officers at the time. And they were told that these motels had been on police radar and suspicions of being part of a sex trafficking ring. Surprise, surprise. With the police investigating the sex trafficking ring lead, they learned that the presumed leader of this shit was a giant turd going by the alias of Dr. Z. Now, wait a second. Why does the term doctor ring a bell for this case? That's right. The self-proclaimed doctor that was found tied to the teen sex hotline phone number on Mama Judith's phone bill. Well, the true identity of Dr. Z was never disclosed or discovered. And the sex trafficking activity linked to these motels had long since hightailed it on out of there. So that left the investigator to turn to the teen hotline lead. So they head over to talk to this doctor. Probably thinking at this point he's going to hit another dead end. However, something new is revealed. The story that this doctor told in 1980 is not the story he's telling now in 1985. In fact, it's completely different for some reason and honestly reeks of bullshit to me. He tells police and the PI that he himself did not run the hotline, but that his wife was actually the one doing the whole thing. He says that runaways would show up at their house all the time looking for his wife and that he remembers seeing Laureen at this at his house sometime after her disappearance. I'm sorry, but what? It only took you four years to remember this? What the fuck is wrong with you, you dickhole? Does this not smell like a Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell situation to you? That's like the total vibe I'm getting from this story this guy's giving. It's just so off-putting and irritating, but ugh, whatever. So this dumbass doctor says he can't provide any more helpful info, but that he does remember seeing Lorraine with a woman going by the name Annie Sprinkle. Now, Annie Sprinkle was a known porn star at the time. Investigators felt that if there was any shred of truth to this statement, that it was pretty much not looking great for Lorraine here, and that the theory of abduction and sex trafficking was a strong one. So they head on over to talk to Sprinkle's. Sprinkles says she doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. She doesn't know Lorraine, has never met her, never seen her, and that her tie to the doctor is solely based on the fact that she knows his wife. She admits to knowing about this weird-ass teen sex hotline, but says she's never called it or interacted with it in any way. They go on to ask her, hey, is there any way that Lorraine was at these motels during this time? And Sprinkles straight up says no, impossible. The motels were being used as shooting sites for the porno films she was in, and she states that there were tons of people constantly on set going in and out. She says that she never crossed paths with Lorraine there. So this next part kind of made me laugh. The book that I previously mentioned stated that the police felt the doctor's statement, you know, the one completely differing from the original one he gave months after Lorraine's disappearance, was more credible than Sprinkles. So they decided to do a little cross-referencing to her statements. They got a hold of all the films Sprinkles had done during 1980 and sat through and watched all of them in hopes of maybe spotting Lorraine in the background. I mean, this sounds like a fucking joke. You swear that a missing 14-year-old girl is going to be just chilling in the background of a porno video after being abducted from halfway across the country without any attention being drawn and flown to California where she sits in the background of a porno film and that Sprinkles doesn't notice this kid while she's filming. Come the fuck on. I think it's safe to suggest this was not a cross-referencing of her story. If anything... Go cross-reference the two wild-ass stories you got from this demented-ass doctor and his nutso teen sex hotline wife and see what you find. Unfortunately and unsurprisingly, neither the doctor nor his wife's name has ever been released to the public. So that's kind of where that lead ends, and again, the case goes cold for the third time. 
At some point, Mama Judith makes the decision to cut the PI loose. The investigation has just not opened up any new leads. Now, sometime in 1986, Mama Judith receives a call from a childhood friend, a potential ex-boyfriend of Lorraine's, by the name of Roger. Roger tells Mama Judith that while he was away from the house, his mom received a call from someone asking to speak to him, claiming to be a previous ex-girlfriend. Roger's mom tells the female that he's not home, and the caller subsequently just hangs up. Roger's mom isn't quite sure what the name of the girl was, but she says it was either Lori or Loreen. This renewed hope for Judith that her daughter was out there somewhere trying to reconnect to family and friends and was just calling all the numbers she could remember. Unfortunately, the police were unable to track this call, and it never led anywhere. 1988 rolls around, and it's now been eight years since Lorraine's disappearance. A man in Anchorage, Alaska, calls police and states that he's pretty sure he saw Lorraine hooking on the street near where he lives. The man says that he that she matched Lorraine's description to a T. Anchorage police go and interview the guy, trying to better determine if this guy is full of shit or not. Turns out they believe he's telling the truth about what he saw. The police head out and try to track down this woman believed to be Lorraine. They never locate anyone matching Lorraine's description. Apparently, a lot of time had passed, and it was possible that the woman had since to move on. So now we're going to go over some disappearances in the area that happened right around the time uh, Lorraine disappeared that some investigators believe may be potentially tied to the case. So being that a good amount of time had passed and no solid leads had come in, the police had started to look outside the box. Like I said, Lorraine was not the only unsolved disappearance in the area. Roughly three weeks prior to Lorraine's disappearance on March 22, 1980, a 15-year-old girl by the name of Rachel Elizabeth Garden had disappeared while walking to her friend's house. Rachel had stopped to buy a pack of gum and some cigarettes at 15, holy fuck, from Rose Corner Market in Newton, New Hampshire. She was last seen walking down Main Street in the direction of her friend's house, and unfortunately, she never made it. She was reported missing the following day at around 10 a.m. Like Lorraine, police initially treated the case as a runaway, which again, she was literally on her fucking way to her friend's house. Why does that scream running away to law enforcement? Her family, of course, was like, no fucking way did she run away. She didn't take anything with her, and she would never leave her horse behind, which she loved more than anything. An eyewitness had stated that they saw Rachel speaking to three men in a car. All three men were checked out, and while they did have criminal records, there was no evidence tying them to Rachel, so no charges were brought up. Eerily enough, one of the men eventually confessed to murdering her, and even went so far as to give police a detailed description of where they could find her body. Police tore that location up, but nothing was ever found in connection to Rachel. She remains missing to this day. Shirley was another 15-year-old girl who went missing in July 13, 1984, at about 9.30 p.m. from Concord, New Hampshire. Shirley had left her sister's apartment and was on her way to pick up some money that was owed to her by some unknown person, and then she planned to head over to her boyfriend's job in Concord, Litho. Several days passed before her family actually reported her missing. This wasn't unusual because Shirley was known for dipping out for a day or two, but she always turned up again. This time she had not. Her boyfriend said she never made it to his job that night. Her sister stated that all of her personal belongings were in the house and nothing was missing. Again, the police categorized it as a runaway because what else could it possibly be? But her family refused to accept that. And what do you know? A few days later, the police start thinking, hey, maybe it's not a runaway case and something bad happened here. It doesn't say what triggered this change of heart, but police interviewed her boyfriend and cleared him as a suspect. They never followed any further leads, and the case went cold. Shirley's parents eventually had her declared legally deceased in 1996, 12 years later. We're moving on now to Denise Ann Denault. Now, Denise is a tad different than the other girls. She was a 25-year-old divorced mother to two children who disappeared June 8, 1980. The book said 1960. I'm pretty sure that was a typo. This was just two months after Laureen had vanished, and Denise was living just two blocks away from where Laureen lived. Super fucking weird. 
Denise was living with a roommate at this time. On the night of her disappearance, she had gone out to a club. The very last sighting of her was at 1.30 a.m. as she was leaving the club in downtown. Witnesses stated that she said she was heading to some other party, but she never made it there or was seen or heard from after that. There's apparently a very noticeable resemblance between Denise and Lorraine, even though Denise is roughly 10 years older than her. This got investigators thinking that there might be a thread that ties all these cases together. So, when police looked into Shirley's case a little more, they found out that she was living just a few doors down from a known serial killer, Terry Rasmussen, a.k.a. the Chameleon Killer. At the time, he was going by the alias Bob Evans. A little about this douche canoe, he remains the sole suspect of the Bear Brook murders and the disappearance of Denise Bowden, different Denise. He was convicted of the murder of his wife, Yoon Soon Joon, in 2003, and died at the High Desert State Prison on December 20, 2010, while serving time for her murder. Being that Rasmussen was active and in the area at the time of these disappearances, investigators and web sleuths alike feel it's possible that he had a connection to these disappearances. Overall, though, none of these cases have been confirmed to be related, and they all remain open to this day. So now we have arrived at the theories, and boy, do they not disappoint. Now, there are theories ranging from one extreme to the next, but I'm going to try to hone in on the ones that make the most logical sense, and I'll give my opinion on what I think happened to Lorraine. So the theory number one is Man Boy and Kristen were in on it. This is a long one, so forgive me. This theory isn't completely out of the realm of possibility for me, and it is one of two that I consider to be what I think happened. So let's unpack this one a little bit. First off, a couple of the issues I ran into that kind of feed this theory for me is one, the confusion of the addresses. Now, I know the internet has pretty much confirmed that her address was 289 Merrimack Street. It's in all the forums I went through. It's on blogs. You Google it. It's there. The only place it doesn't come up as 289 is the motherfucking DOJ's website. Probably one of the only few verifiable resources for this case, and it says 239. I did my best to research previous address history for Judith with my limited resources. Although usually 90% accurate, it didn't even spit back a Mary Mac address for me, period. It was a completely different street name altogether. So, for argument's sake, we're going to just go with the fact that my research was inaccurate. Now, if you remember what I said earlier about this inconsistency, I stated that I looked up both addresses just to get a feel for the situation and whatnot. Now, Google Maps puts me in front of 236 Merrimack instead of 239, which again, for this argument, I'll chalk it up to being an apartment building, and the way they number apartment buildings confuses me. It's also important to note that 239 Merrimack has a back building as well. 289 Merrimack pulls up right in front of the building, no problems. Now, obviously the images that pull up are much more recent images than what it was in 1980. But both buildings are eerily similar. Again, they are both three-story apartment buildings that are super, super narrow, in my opinion, as are all the buildings in this area, really. They are both built within the same time frame of 1908 to 1910 and bear the same style. They are both currently white, and the paint job looks weathered as fuck, so I'm sure it's safe to say they've both been white for a while. They both have back alleys that pass directly behind the buildings as well. They are on opposite sides of the street, of course, and about a football field's length away from each other, with 239 being to the west. Now, one part of the story that stood out to me was the part where Man Boy said he heard voices and left out the back door. They're on the third floor, so I immediately was like, what the fuck, you have a back door in an apartment on the third floor? Usually you get a balcony with a sliding door and no way to climb down unless there's a fire escape or something like you see in like New York apartments. I guess New Hampshire's apartments are different because 289 Merrimack has none of this. No outside visible steps, with the exception of a few steps as you enter the building and a few on the left side. 
There's no obvious or noticeable remodeling where steps may have been at some point. The back of the building 